Hey, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, digital online uh, session. Um, it shouldn't be too hard. It shouldn't take you more than an hour to complete what we need to do uh, today. So just, uh, just to outline what you guys need to do uh, real quickly, um, basically, you're just going to watch two uh, little videos here. Um, they're over on our course uh, webpage, which you're watching one of them right um, now. But over here on our course webpage, it just says Digital Day. And so right here, this homework review is the video you're watching right, uh, right now. You're going to watch that. You're going to take notes. Just basically copy down everything I write down. And then you're going to submit it to the Assignments tab. And that's the first video watched. And then the second video is down here, Activity Working uh, with um, Rational Functions. And uh, I sent you an email with this handout. You can print out the handout if you want, but you don't have to. You can just do it on a separate piece of paper. So click on that video, watch it, and then that's it uh, for the day. Um, so there's basically two things to do. Um, and uh, again, it should probably take you more than uh, more than an hour to do it. So let's get back here and talk about how this is going to change what we're doing or our schedule a little bit. Um, there we go. Okay, so... Our exam, I'm going to move our exam just to make sure we're all on the same page. So it was scheduled for um, for Tuesday, and we could have it Tuesday, but it's not really going to matter if we have it Thursday. So I think it'll help some of those students that, you know, um, maybe didn't get didn't read their email or whatever. OK, uh, so exam two will be on Thursday. Um, I left the my math lab open for rational functions and models part one and two and added a couple more. Uh, chances. So if you haven't uh, gotten to that or you want to work some more of the problems to get some more of the points, uh, feel free to do that. So I think I left it open until Tuesday. And then I sent the review to you guys uh, in that email. It's not due till Wednesday, but if you guys want to get a head start um, and practice some of the problems, you know, there's a solution video uh, online. So um, you can practice the problems and then check the solution video to see if you got them uh, correct or not. All right, and always feel free to send me uh, an email or text if you have any uh, have any questions. And I will be online today uh, at our class time. Um, I think we meet, what, at 10 a.m. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free uh, to click on the Zoom link that I sent you in your uh, email, and uh, I'll be online. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys um, might have, but that's optional. You don't have to do that. And you have until the end of the day to complete uh, these two uh, videos. All right. So hopefully you have your paper and pen or pencil ready because here's what you need to copy down. We're going to review some of the homework problems. Uh, and this is a great review for uh, the exam. So we're going to come down here and take a look at number two. And we're going to review basically how do you solve uh, inequalities. And so let's take a look. Oops. Uh, let's take a look here at this problem here. And I'm just going to copy it down on the side here. And so this is number two. Remember, you just copy down everything I write down. And so we have x squared minus x minus 20 divided by, and then we have x squared minus 9x plus 14. And we want to find out when is this guy bigger than zero. And we're going to change it a little bit. We're going to make it bigger than or equal to, because I enjoy that problem a little bit more. I think it's a little bit better. All right, so big ideas, all right? So the big ideas uh, are what? We need to find out when this thing is positive, negative, or equal to zero. So we're going to do this sign diagram over here. And so how do we do a sign diagram? Well, the idea is you just draw the number line. So this is like the x-axis right here. And we want to find places where this function, where this function here could possibly change sign. And so remember, for this one, there's two things we have to find. We have to find the zeros. So we have to find when it's zero. And then we also have to worry about when it's undefined. That's where you possibly change sign with this type of function. And so remember, it's actually pretty easy to find these. The zeros are in this when this num numerator is equal to zero. So 
That's when x squared minus x minus 20 is equal to 0. And it's undefined when that denominator is equal to 0. So x squared minus 9x plus 14. And if we can find those x values, that's the only possible places that this function can change sign. And that has to do with the fact that, you know, when you have a continuous function, it can only change sign at zeros. And when you have a function that might not be continuous, you find those places where it's not continuous, then that's another place where it may change zeros. And so the undefined place is basically down here. This is where the function's not continuous. All right, so let's do this, which is, you know, not, not that bad. We've been doing a lot of these, so it's just a guess and check. So x plus or minus something, x plus or minus something is equal to zero. And the something comes from the 20s, and so the 20 there, so it's probably 4 and 5, I would guess. And to get that negative x, we have a minus on the 5 and a plus on the 4, because that gives you a negative 1 when you add them together. And so you can see I have either x plus 4 equals 0, because remember, you're multiplying here this times that. Or you have x minus 5 is equal to 0. And so my two zeros come from this here. You subtract 4 from both sides, so x equal negative 4. Or over here, we add 5 to both sides, so x is equal to 5. And so over here on my sign diagram, I can put these guys. And so let's put here negative 4. And then we'll put um, a 5 right here. And you might want to label these guys. These are zeros. All right, so you have a zero when you plug these numbers into that blue function over here. Okay, let's do the next one. And so for the next one, we just factor it again. So it's just a guess. So x plus or minus something times x plus or minus something equal to zero. And we're looking at the 14. And the most common way to factor 14 is probably a 2 times 7. So we got 2 and 7 there. And we need a negative 9. So you just put a minus on the 2 and a minus on the 7. So that should give you that negative 9x in the middle when you multiply it out. And then the same thing happens. This times that is equal to zero. So either this is equal to zero or that's equal to zero. And so then we add two to both sides and we get x equal to two on this one. Add seven to both sides, we get x equal to seven on that one. And so here we have a two and here we have a seven. And those are all the possible points where this function up here that we started with, this rational function, could possibly change sign. And so, oh, I should write here maybe U and D for undefined. And U and D over here. Because those aren't zeros. That's just where the function's undefined. Uh, In fact, I think for this one, you have vertical asymptotes there. Um, all right. So now what do we need to do? Now we need to do some test points. So we're going to test points to the left and in between and to the right. So let's take, make this a little bit better. So let's make this negative 5 over here. That's probably the easiest easiest point to take to the left of negative 4, and then probably 0 between negative 4 and 2, and then 3, and then 6, and then 8. Really important not to put these numbers on your number line, otherwise you may get confused. And then, of course, we're going to plug this back in to this original function over here, but not this form. So remember, we're not supposed to use our calculator. So what I'll do is I'll plug it into the factored form. So the, fa the top factors is x plus 4 times x minus 5. And then divided by, and then x minus 2 times x minus 7. And so now we're going to plug these numbers in that we found these test points into here and see if they're positive or negative. And that's going to tell us the sign of the function in that uh, on that interval, basically. So you plug in negative 5, you have negative 5 plus 4, which is negative 1. And you don't have to show a ton of work. Just write down negative 1. And negative 5 minus 5 is negative 10. And then negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7. And then negative 5 minus 7 is a negative 12. And so we don't care, remember, about the actual value. All we care about is the sign. So on top, you have a positive. On bottom, you have a positive. And so you know that's going to be a positive. And as soon as you do that, you do know the sign is going to alternate because of because of the type of functions we're working with. Uh, but we still have to show work. So now we're going to plug in 0. And so we plug in 0 into this guy right here. And so 0 plus 4 is 4. 0 minus 5 is a negative 5. And then 0 minus 2 is a negative 2. 
and zero minus seven is at negative seven, so that's me showing work. And then of course I know it's negative, but you can see I have a negative on top and a positive on the bottom. And then I plug in three. And so three plus four is seven, three minus five is negative two, three minus two is a one, three minus seven is a negative four, and that's a positive because you have a negative on top and negative on the bottom. So when you divide, you get a positive. Plug in six. So just keep repeating, right? So plug in six, 10, plug in six. So six minus five is one. Divided by six minus two is four. And then six minus seven is negative one. Yes, it's a negative, right? Positive or negative. So yeah, you knew it was going to alternate. So everything's working out just like it should. Eight plus four is 12. Eight minus five is three. And then divided by eight minus two is six. And eight minus seven is one. And it's definitely a positive. All right, so... Now that we have the sign diagram, we can use it to figure out when we are bigger than or equal to zero. So for bigger than, we just shade in all the places where we have a plus. So all those places where we have plus, we have bigger than. So that's when the function is positive. And then for this equal to, we put closed brackets, or if you want square brackets, on the zeros. But we leave parentheses where it's undefined. So parentheses where it's undefined, but square bracket on the zero, parentheses on the seven, because that's where it's undefined. So therefore, I'll write this up here so we can all see it. My solution set S is equal to a parentheses negative infinity, comma, negative four, square bracket, because negative four is a zero, union, parentheses two, comma, five, and then square bracket, and again, that's a parenthesis. Sometimes parentheses kind of look like square brackets, but it should be the square bracket, right on the five, because that's a zero, and then union seven to infinity, parenthesis. And so there's my answer. I got all the glorious work there, so I get all the credit, and part, definitely a lot of partial credit if I made a silly mistake, uh, but that's it. All right, so that's solving a rational uh, inequality. And what I usually tell you guys is if you look at that review, there's actually three inequalities on the review. I can't ask you all three uh, inequalities. I don't have, we don't have, really don't have enough time on that exam. So I usually just kind of pick one uh, of those. Same with the equations. On the equations, you know, there's three equations on that review, but I have to probably pick one. You know, I can't ask you all three. Although I will tell you, you do wind up solving all three equations eventually because some of the uh, solutions are throughout the uh, exam and other types of problems. It's not inside problems, like a word problem or uh, uh, finding a zero or something. Uh, so they're, they're finding an X or Y intercept or something like that. So they're, through, they're spread throughout the uh, exam. There's inside of the problems. All right. What's next? Um, okay. So I think that finishes off rational functions and models part uh, one. So I wanted to practice an inequality uh, with you guys um, today. Um, what's next? So that's part one. Of course, there's part two. So in part two, what we did is we started doing the graphing part of these uh, rational functions. So we kind of went through all the steps, you know, find the x-intercepts, the y-intercepts, the vertical asymptotes, the horizontal asymptotes, uh, and graph it, making sure to include asymptotes and intercepts. So we're going to do this problem in the next video. So in fact, uh, we're going to do a problem that is a problem on the exam, but I just changed the numbers. Um, and so that's in the next video that you're going to watch. And there, of course, there was a worksheet that I sent you guys in the email, but and you can just do it on a separate piece of paper if you don't have a printer um, at home. But there are a couple problems I want to do from here. So one problem I want to talk about is this number th three. So number three is a nice problem. I usually tell you guys it's probably not the best exam problem. It's not the best exam problem because if you don't understand how to anything about if you don't under, if you don't really understand it you can't get a lot of partial credit and and exam problems they should have lots of partial credit um, that way you can get something out of it because you guys usually know something right there should be little arrows down here on this these little guys it's kind of hard to see them but how do you do this uh this this problem here and, and maybe we can maybe I can blow this up a little bit because it's a little small and so the idea behind this problem and what number is this this is number three, right? So number three is we want to do kind of like the opposite of what we've been doing in a sense. So 
what have we been doing? We've we've been, you know, given a formula, find the graph, basically, right? Now we're going to give the graph and you have to find the formula. So it's kind of like the inverse of the problem. And it's a little bit trickier to do. But once I show you how to do it, you're like, oh, that 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 makes sense. And it kind of gives you more insight into these rational functions. So the first step is just to kind of write f of x equals and then write divided by. Because you know something's going to go on top and something's going to go on the bottom. And so remember, on top, what we have are zeros. So zeros go on top. And also, if you have a hole, holes also go on the bottom. So holes appear, remember, on the top and bottom. And then on the bottom, you also have vertical asymptotes. So we'll just write VA for vertical asymptotes. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of slowly go across this function. And then if we see holes, zeros, or vertical asymptotes, we'll put them into our formula for our function. So the first thing you're going to see as you go across this function is you see a hole right here. So there's my hole. It happens at negative 1. And so I'm going to put a hole. The way you do that is you write x, and then you kind of have a choice because it's hard to remember which one it is, plus or minus 1. It turns out to be plus 1. And the reason I know that is if you plug in negative 1, you get a 0 there. And then on the bottom, you write the same thing, x plus 1. And what that does is you can plug in any number you want for x except for negative 1 because right? negative 1 makes that denominator 0. And so basically, this is just a 1. Because if you plug in like 10, you get 10 plus 1, which is 11, divide by 10 plus 1, which is 11, which is just a 1. So it's not really doing anything, but it makes it undefined at negative 1 because you can't divide by 0. So it just puts a hole in that, that function at negative 1. And then we come across the hole, and we kind of go all, all the way up. And so we get this vertical asymptote right here. So that dashed line where that function's approaching, and that happens right at 1, right? So that's the vertical line x equals 1. And so we put that in the bottom. And here we put x minus 1. Because when you plug in 1, that makes it on D fine. So it happens at input 1. And then finally, we come back, we trace this, we trace, and we have a 0 right here at 2. And so that goes in the top. And so we put an x minus 2 in the top. And we're done. All right, so that formula, and if you want to check it, Someone in the other class said, well, how do you check your work on them? Well, you can just graph it on your graphing calculator, and you'll see you basically get this graph back, but you will not be able to see the hole on your calculator because it's so small the calculator can't represent it. But there is a hole there. If you hit trace and put negative 1 in there, it'll, it'll say nothing, basically, um, because there's nothing there on your calculator. Uh, but that's a nice problem. It's, it's a nice bonus problem or a challenge problem. Um, but not a great test problem, but it's a good homework problem for you guys to see. And, and now that you see how to do it, he's like, oh, that's that's not too bad. This one also has a horizontal asymptote. And maybe we should say that because you could make this problem a little bit more complicated, but it has a horizontal asymptote at y equal uh, one. Um, this does have a horizontal asymptote at y equal one. If you multiply it out, it's going to look like this on top, x squared minus x minus 2 divided by on bottom, it's going to look like x squared minus 1. And then notice the leading terms here on top and bottom are x squared, so they have the same power, which means that it has a horizontal asymptote at those leading coefficients, which is just 1 over 1. So y is just equal to uh, 1. So it does have that horizontal asymptote. You could make that a little bit harder by moving the horizontal asymptote up or uh, down, but that's not something that I'm really interested in, in you guys uh, doing right right now. The big problem we really want to do is, given the formula, can you find the graph? And again, in the next video, we're going to spend a, a lot of time doing that, and uh, you'll practice it, and, and you have the exam problem uh, for the exam. All right, there is one other problem I want to do on here, so let's go back here and go down to the word problems. And so this is the last problem we need to do on this uh, video. And so here's the problem right here. <clears throat> it's number five on your homework. So let's write this. And we're going to turn this into a slightly different problem. This problem only wants you to find the formula, but we're going to find not just the formula, but also uh, the minimum cost, because that's how I would ask it on the, an exam. All right. So 
a contractor is to build a warehouse whose rectangular floor. Ah, so here comes a rectangle. Always the rectangle. And so a rectangular floor uh, whose area is 1,000 square feet. So let's put 1,000 feet squared. And because it's area, I always put it on the inside. If it was perimeter stuff, I put it on the outside. The warehouse will be separated into two rectangular rooms by an interior wall. So let's put an interior wall here. It doesn't matter if you do it vertical or horizontal. I'm going to do it vertical, so you should do it vertical. Um, the cost for the exterior wall is $225 dollars per linear foot. So here I'm going to write exterior. So I'll just write EXT for exterior. And then I'll write 20, $225 per, and you just put per foot. I don't know why they put linear foot, like as if there's any other type of foot, but whatever. Um, and then the cost for the interior wall, it says, is $250 per linear foot. And then interior is $250 per foot. And then what they ask us to find is a formula for the uh, cost function in terms of the dimensions of the warehouse, the rectangular floor X. So we're not going to do that. We're going to find the min cost. We will find that formula on the way, though. So find min cost, because that's probably what I would ask you guys to do. I'd say, OK, now find the minimum cost to build the warehouse house basically and then we should label our side so we'll call this side x and then this side y of course and then of course this is x and this is y and we label all the sides on this one because this stands for the x feet is the length and y feet is the width and then you know you have an interior so you have y feet there so everybody has uh, a, a variable on it um, because we have to count all the sides uh, basically in the end all right and so there's my picture so there I can get a couple points for drawing the right picture and writing down what I need to find. And then equation. So it's like, what are you trying to find? And so that's the reason I write all this down is because I want to find the min cost. And so normally it's like the minimum perimeter or maximum or minimum perimeter, maximum minimum area stuff. And so it's like P or A. But for cost, we write C. And so C is equal to. And then we want to figure out the cost. We, I usually start down here of one side, basically. And this is X feet, and the exterior walls are $225 per foot. So if your brain tells you the answer right now, you're good to go for that one side. If it doesn't, just make up some numbers. So the idea is come over here and say, what if this was one foot? How much would that cost? Well, it's $225 per foot, so that's just $225. How about if we change it to two feet now? Well, then you take another $225 or $225 times two. And then you do it for three feet, the same thing, $225 times three. And then for X feet, just replace the numbers with X, $225 times X. And so here, the cost for that one side would be 225 times X. And as soon as you see that's the cost of that side, this side should be pretty easy. It's just 225, but not times X, but times Y. And then plus, and you just slowly go across. The cost of that side is another 225 x plus the cost of this side is another 225 and then a y a 225 times y and then finally we can't forget that interior wall so we have to go down the interior here but it's not 225 y it's 250 y and so there's our formula and now we can add like terms and so here i'll add my like terms so c is going to be equal to and so what do we have? We have 225x is 225x is, okay, so that's what, 450x. And then plus, we have 225y's, 225, so that's 450y's, then plus 250, which I think is 700y's. There we go. And so there's our formula, but we're not quite done with the formula because we want to graph this, remember, to find the minimum, basically. And so we need to get rid of Y. So how do we get rid of Y? Well, there's this number we haven't used right here, that area number. So right here, I'll write 1,000. That's the area equals X times Y. And so I can solve that for Y, just divide both sides by X. And so I get 1,000 over X is equal to Y. 
And I'm going to take that 1,000 over X. Uh, I'm going to remove my tablet here. There we go. And so I'm going to plug it in for that Y value right there. So let me move this up just a little bit. And so now what we can do is what? We could plug this in. And so we're going to get C equals 450X plus, and then we have 700 and then times that Y, which is really 1,000 over X. And we could probably do that multiplication. That probably would be something good for us to do. So 450, my fives keep looking like threes. So 450 X's. And then plus, we have seven. And then how many zeros? One, two, three, four, five zeros. So one, two, three, four, five zeros. So that's 700,000 divided by X. So that's a pretty big little, a little number there. Um, and that's the answer to that problem. So right up here, notice they just want the formula. So that would be the answer to that, my math lab problem. But if this was an exam problem, I wouldn't just ask for the formula or have to give the formula. You'd also have to then find the min cost. So now... What we want to do is we're going to graph this. So we're going to solve this little problem right here. So basically, we're going to take our graphing calculator, and we want to plug that function in and see what we get out. So grab your graphing calculator here. and I'm going to have to go down here and hold this up. All right, so here's my graphing calculator. We want to turn it on here and hit Y equals. Clear out whatever's in there, if there's anything in there. And we'll type the formula. So it's 450X. And then plus, and here we have 700,000. So make sure you put 700,000. Sometimes you guys put like 70 or 7,000. So it should have five zeros on it. And then divide by X. And then we're going to hit our window button here. And then we're going to type in our window. Now, here's where we have to think a little bit, right? So X is the, X is the length of that warehouse. So we'll start at zero. And then we have to go out. So... It's not a very big warehouse, honestly, because it's a thousand square feet, but 10 is probably too small. So maybe I'll go out to, um, let's try 100. Let's just try 100 and see what happens, right? So we'll do 100. We go to Zoom, go down to Zoom Fit, just working the buttons from left to right, basically. And it's going to draw a graph for us. And uh, it came up a little bit. I could probably use that, but, you know, I just... I just like to make it look nice. So I'm going to do 200 now. So I bought the window, hit 200, go down to Zoom, or over to Zoom, hit Zoom Fit. And I just feel a lot better about it, right? And we, we kind of talked about that it's just a representation. So remember, it doesn't actually hit the x-axis. You know, how do we how do we know that? Well, that's mostly through experience. But you should know, like, we're just zoomed out really far. So sometimes when the graph looks like it does something, you have to be careful uh, and make sure it's just not, we're just zoomed up far away. It's like, I kind of class always use Earth as an example. It's like, you're really far from Earth. It looks like a marble, but of course it's not a marble. As you zoom in, you see more uh, and more uh, interesting behavior. So this one, just go down and come up. So it looks something like that. We're trying to find that minimum value down there. So something comma something. And so how do we find the minimum? Well, your calculator is going to do it for us. And this is one of those problems that you really do need a calculator to uh, to solve it. So on my calculator, I'm going to hit second uh, trace to calculate, and then just go down to minimum, hit enter, and then it's going to walk us through that left bound, right bound. Because what the calculator is doing, it's it's using um, it's using a program, right? It's really an algorithm, and you have to tell it where to look, basically. So you kind of say, okay, left. Now the cursor is hard to use, so I tell you guys, hey, just hit zero. Because you know zero is on the left of that minimum, enter. And then 200 was that X max. We know that's on the right. And then for a guess, just hit enter. And it'll pop right on it. And this one, of course, the numbers are not nice. So this one, we're just going to round to the nearest whole number. So we have 39. So we'll put a 39 right here. And I might have to use a little bit of an eraser here to uh, erase that, I think. Let's see. So I don't have enough room, probably. Um, and then the other number was what? So the other number was 35,496. So 35,496. And we just rounded to the nearest whole 
uh, whole number. So notice, you know, you just look at the first decimal point here. If it's five or bigger, you round up. So that's a four. So you just drop it off or just drop it, uh, drop it off. And so now that we have these two numbers, and maybe I'll put, you know, that that was zero and we went up to 200. So now that we have those two numbers, you got to give me the right number. So remember, what's the right number? Well, we want the minimum cost. And the minimum cost, well, that's the output. So over here, we can write the min cost is equal to, and that's $35,496. And that's it. And that completes that uh, problem. Um, yeah. All right, so that's the end of the first video. Do not forget to watch the second video. That one's really important because that's a problem that's going to be on the exam. And I want to make sure you guys uh, know exactly what's expected uh, of you when you do that problem. Because sometimes you guys just give me an answer and you have to show some uh, work that, that explains where that answer uh, came from. Um, all right. Hope you guys have a safe and great, uh, great day.